Mesdames et messieurs, bienvenue à cette conférence de clôture du symposium sur la marchandisation du récréatif à l'ère du numérique. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the closing session of the symposium on the commodification of leisure in the digital era. The session will take place mostly in English with a simultaneous translation in French. So please make sure to click the translation button to select the language of your choice. Je suis Sylvia Kérouz, professeure au département de sociologie et d'anthropologie de l'Université Concordia, et je dirige l'équipe de recherche Hermès euh, qui organise cet événement. Cette initiative est aussi le fruit d'une collaboration avec plusieurs universités du Québec, notamment l'Université Laval, l'Université de Sherbrooke et l'UCAM, ainsi que le groupe de recherche, euh, la chaire de recherche sur le jeu et euh, le, le Pleasure Consuming Games. C'est au nom de tous ces partenaires que je vous remercie de votre participation aujourd'hui et je remercie particulièrement Mme Waldegorgis et notre invité de marque, M. Edward Snowden, pour de leur participation. Over the past three days, our symposium gathered 300 delegates from 24 different countries to discuss issues related to the transformation of games, mobile games, and their role and significance in our daily life. In our conclusion, we raised serious concerns about the, the capacity of these games that are so ubiquitous in our daily life to collect personal data, to monitor and manipulate our consumption, and to share private information across platforms. This reality raises concern about the risk of surveillance, manipulation, and circulation of our data. Today, we will have a conversation about games as forms of surveillance, and also about how we might learn from play and how to place surveillance systems in ways that preserve possibilities for privacy and anonymity. When the organizing committee of this symposium first met in 2019, one of our colleagues, and Claude Savard, threw the idea that it would be amazing to invite Mr. Snowden to discuss with us these timely and important issues. Of course, we all laughed and said that we can always dream. Today, I would like to thank Mr. Snowden for generously accepting our invitation. We will have the great pleasure over the, 90, the next 90 minutes to engage in an inspiring conversation between Mr. Snowden and Mrs. Azebaldi-Gorgis. Let me briefly introduce our speakers. Mrs. Waldi-Gorgis uh, est un pilier du diffuseur public CBC Radio-Canada. Elle a couvert pendant plus de 20 ans uh, de services l'Europe, l'Afrique et les États-Unis, et plus récemment, le procès du meurtre de M. George Floyd. Elle sera désormais la correspondante de Radio-Canada à Washington. J'aimerais la remercier chaleureusement d'animer cet échange que nous attendons tous impatiemment avec M. Snowden. M. Snowden does not need, does not need any introduction, but he's the author of new, the new memoir, Permanent Record, He's a former CIA officer and National Security Agency consultant. Snowden risked everything to expose the U.S. government system of mass surveillance. He's the subject of the Oscar-winning best documentary, Citizen Four, and the critically acclaimed Oliver Stone film, Snowden. Appearing live from Moscow, Snowden continues to speak out about technologies and practices that have created the most effective means of social control in history of our species. Everything we do now lasts forever, not because we want to remember, but because we are no longer allowed to forget, he says, evoking the key theme of permanent record. He also says, helping to create that system is my greatest regret, as one of the world's most passionate and authoritative voices on privacy and cybersecurity, Snowden continues to warn us of the growing threats of our digital age. Since gaining asylum in Russia, Snowden has remained in the headlines as an, as an impassioned and authoritative champion of privacy, civil liberties, and cybersecurity during what he calls the greatest redistribution of power since the Industrial Revolution. Snowden continues to sound the alarm on mass surveillance and the collection of data by both governments and corporate entities. He has, invited, he, he has been invited to speak at venues ranging from international investment conferences to the TED stage and the Sorbonne, receiving glowing reviews and passionate applause from audiences around the world. I would like today to welcome with our audience, Mr. Snowden, with one more passionate applaud. Thank you.
that was <laughs> incredibly generous. Thank you very much, Sylvia. Um, hello, Edward Snowden. Thank you for being with us today. Merci beaucoup d'être avec nous aujourd'hui. Alors, before we start this conversation, we were all wondering, uh, you're still in exile in Russia. How are you today? Considered. Uh, it's funny, given the uh, road that I've been and how unlikely it is that I've come out uh, largely okay. I have, and I'm, I'm very grateful for it. Great. So we're, we, we've, had, we've been through quite a difficult year with the pandemic, and the lockdown response to the pandemic has increased the amount of time people are spending online, whether it's uh, gaming online. Um, I was reading your, your book, Permanent Record, and you were writing, from the age of 12, I try to spend um, most my, my every waking moment online. This sentence could be said by any 12-year-olds or 13-year-olds today. Um, what is the difference today? And what are your concern about having seeing so many people online, whether it's teenagers or adults? So one interesting thing about uh, games when I was young, and games of, of the youth today, and I think for anybody who's from my age court or older uh, certainly remembers this, is the games were uh, a little bit more solipsistic. Like it was you and the pinball machine. It was you and the Pac-Man arcade cat. It was you and your Nintendo floor at home, which had no concept at the time of a global network uh, to which you would connect to your friends and everything like that. That, that would come much later. Um, you may sit on the couch with the sibling, with a friend, and you could play a game together. Uh, but everything was local. Your, uh, all of the choices that you made in a game, all of the histories that you had created, all of the adventures uh, that you had undertaken were saved on a cloud couch that was you know, on top of the dresser TV. Uh, today, uh, kids are on their phones, right? Uh, or they're on their you know, PlayStation 5 uh, or you know, Xbox or even when we look at the uh, Nintendo Switch and the Wii U, uh, or classically the personal computer, these all have internet functions. And increasingly, games are being designed intentionally not to function without a network connection. Sometimes this is justified as an anti-piracy measure. Uh, but we also see trends and advancements in the way that uh, games are being developed and through practices of telemetry. This is as you're connecting to the game to begin playing the world, not only do you play the game, you send data about your play to the developer of the game or in uh, the context of mobile games that are often provided for free, are served to you and you have to you know, watch a video to receive some incremental reward or they're in-app purchases or they try to cross sell you on other things or they try to get you to uh, bring your other friends into the game as you would, you know, years ago by calling them and asking them to come over. Uh, now through their phone, it creates this uh, sort of vortex uh, where the divisions between your life online and your life uh, offline are increasingly blurred. When I was young, we used to say in real life, right, uh, to distinguish what we did online and offline. Nobody says that anymore because we recognize today that digital life is real life. But unfortunately, our digital lives are transparent to everyone else, but opaque to us. We don't see how we are being watched. Uh, we don't see how things as innocent as the way we play games uh, are being uh, quantified and uh, analyzed and increasingly shared or sold. So, so what you're saying basically is that the gamer is no longer considered as a consumer, uh, is considered as a consumer, but no longer as a, as a player. So uh, gaming is more commercialized, monetized, and more surveilled. So what is, what is your concern and should we be concerned? Well, sure. And I mean, anyone who uh, is involved in games uh, to a deep degree hears about it to some extent, right? The most casual gamers uh, may have no awareness of this. 
Uh, and that's very dangerous um, because that, that's really where the, most, the deepest exploitation and some of the worst actors in the space are developers of uh, games targeting very casual audiences. Um, and it, I think it's true to say that um, today gamers are often being themselves. Uh, when we look at the sophistication increase of uh, psychological manipulation, of uh, behavioral advertising, behavioral influencing techniques um, that are being used uh, to conflate uh, the leisure activity of game playing and the different categories of games, games of skill, games of chance, uh, to introduce addictive elements from games of chance into all games, right? This is, this is like the classic uh, loot box mechanic where you have a um, sort of guaranteed cost imposed on you as the player, uh, whether we're talking about a cost of time, uh, whether we're talking about you really have to send a dollar to whoever the game developer is, uh, for a non-guaranteed outcome. You get a chance to you know, open something, but there's no uh, promise of, that what's in it uh, is actually what you want, what you're after. Uh, what this means is that uh, we have a less reliable connection um, to our, uh, we have less reliable control over our futures, over uh, the direction of the narrative, the direction of our experience in games today than we did in a prior generation where games were um, more clearly defined. They were more deterministic, right? Um, if you did a certain thing, if you went a certain way, if you, in a game, for example, talked to this person, opened this door, or looked in this box, you made a certain choice you would receive a certain outcome. Uh, now, players look in the same box you know, in different cities, different states, the same player looking in two different times a day, and the outcomes could be entirely different. Uh, and that, unfortunately, was used uh, not to increase the level of enjoyment for the player, uh, but to improve frequently the financial position of the game's developer. They say, if you want to have a better experience, you should, for example, play us more. How about, I mean, in your opinion, how is, you know, there, you, you're saying, and also this opposing conclusion is that they're collecting data, data. How is this mm -hmm. data being used? And um, is it becoming a permanent record as well? Well, all the data that's being collected about us, whether we're talking about the context of games, whether we're talking about the kind of shoes you buy, the kind of articles you read, the kind of things that you post on social media, um, these are all being gathered in uh, their sort of pattern and increasingly perfect record of our private lives. Uh, and as you mentioned, this record becomes permanent as the tech advance of technology allows them to store cheap, uh, a greater and greater um, body of data. Uh, of us. Now, uh, in the context of games, that can be your genre interests, what kind of games you play. Uh, it can be the kind of actions that you take in in games, uh, a quite common mechanic uh, today, is you get little trophies for in-game activities that you've done. So this is within a particular, you know, a big body of choices. Games are often uh, classical defined as simply a series of interesting choices. Um, one player might choose to do this. Another player may choose to do that. Um, and without, whichever one you do, choice A or choice B, on your account that your friends can view, that the uh, game's network can certainly view, often the game developer can view, you'll get uh, this little digital trophy. It's just like a little picture, a little flag that said, it said this player did this. Uh, and so it's supposed to create uh, allegedly this kind of social element, the sense of pride. You look back at all the things you did in all of these different games, uh, but what happens when that's not private? What happens when it's not being used um, just for fun, just as a little personal trophy uh, But people who have access to this data uh, begin to use that to correlate it with choices, choices of interest. Not only what game did you play, how did you 
playing that game, particularly in, when we're talking about nature games. Uh, it's very popular today for there to be moral choices in this. They try to present you with like the trolley problem. Uh, you can save this person or you can save this person, but you can't save both. Uh, and there are sort of evil uh, ways to play the games. There are good ways to play the games. Interestingly, we see people uh, widely when we talk on a social scale, uh, much more frequently tend to play the good route. What we're seeing is a whole new way to analyze people's choices, to define them beyond just what they look for, what they buy, what they read, but what they choose to do often when they do that anyone is watching. When they think it's just a game, nothing matters, right? Uh, because this is a digital world, uh, no matter how villainous or how good you are, um, it all disappears. It's a, you know, a sandbox, it's a playpen. Uh, but what if the choices that you made are being used to judge you in the most benign ways, suggest a different game, you like this game, maybe you'll play another game like this uh, for you to buy, or it could be something much more complex. And I think we're likely to see this happening on an increasing and more sophisticated basis as time moves forward. But how is this information about your behavior or the way you play? How is this? Um, uh, how 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 dangerous is it? I mean, how what, how should we react? Or should we be concerned about that? I mean, most people are saying, "Well, you know, I have nothing to hide, whether that, wh whether I'm surveilled or not. You know, this is me." And what do you respond to people who say that? Well, the saying that you don't care about privacy because you have nothing to hide is no different than saying you don't care about freedom of speech because you have nothing to say. Uh, what you're trying to do is, or what you are doing, is reordering uh, who bears the burden in society. In a free society, you don't have to justify your rights. <laughs> if you do, it's not a right. Instead, society has to justify its infringement on you. So, Instead of the government having to demonstrate, for example, why it would need access to this information, uh, going to a court, showing uh, probable cause for seeking a warrant to do some kind of investigation, they create social pressures to basically abrade the protections that we inherited. And now go instead of them having to go through the court, do all, perform all this investigative burden, judge to establish that this is fair, and then do all this. They go, well, it would be easier if you just tell us this, because if you don't tell us this, isn't that strange? Isn't that suspicious? Why wouldn't you do this, right? And what is the value of these rights in the first place? Now, the right to privacy uh, is the foundation of all rights. It's from which every individual and collective right uh, derives. When you think about uh, freedom of speech, it doesn't mean anything if you don't have that space in which to develop your own original thoughts, to figure out what it is that you think and believe, and to share that probably carefully with people that you trust that won't harm you, mistake, you say something stupid, you say something offensive. And having tested that, introduce it out to a larger and larger group until you're confident enough in it that you are willing to be judged for it. Uh, if you think about uh, owning private property, have that word private built into language, to own anything, so from an idea to the possibility to think to a place to lay your head, without privacy, uh, you are owned by society rather than by yourself. Even when we look at things like uh, due process, the right to a trial, uh, these recognize that we inherently have a right to the self that must be overcome by society. When we lose that, something very great indeed. And just to circle back to the question, should we be concerned about this type of data collection? Whether we're talking about games, whether again, we're talking about our online habits, whether we're talking about our pseudo online habits, like social media, right, where people you know, oh, you're posting it out there in the world. But for most people, they're not really posting it for the world. 
they're posting for their family, posting it for their friends, the people who actively follow them. Most people don't have 10 million followers, right? It can't seem to be seen as a truly public statement uh, if we are not presuming a truly public scale. But it is, and it happens uh, in the ways that we least expect and often in the least favorable contexts. Whether we're talking about small scale manipulations by these actors who have access to this data, uh, what is really happening is power is being redistributed away from the individual, uh, away from the uninstitutional community. Uh, this is uh, group and community level individuals, right? Not together as a population, as a class, uh, but they are not the uh, institutional interests of a capitalist society. Uh, whether we're talking about civil society here, where it's NGO groups that are trying to uh, influence policy this way uh, or the other, often with good intentions, right? Or truly self-interested uh, commercial organizations uh, or even governmental organizations, what we see is that if you are not an institutional power, um, you have very little visibility into this kind of information, even about yourself, certainly about others, certainly about what the government is doing, certainly about what these companies are doing. And they have lawyers, they have uh, public relations specialists, they have advertising and branding. You can image of them, but you do not get the facts of their activities beyond what they represent them to be. Now, on the other side of that, these institutions, uh, even something as simple as a games company, uh, gets you to install Candy Crush on your phone, right? Uh, these are reporting metrics about your interests, about you know what apps are installed, all of these different things, uh, categories of behavior that are happening uh, on your phone. They're being reported through software development, it uh, analytic frameworks, right? These are little tools that games developers uh, just put into their game because it provides them added value. Uh, one, through monetization networks, uh, share information about your activities, your habits, where you're at, what you're doing, you know, um, your, your interests, as far as the permissions on your phone permit. They gather everything they can, basically. And then they sell it and resell it to data brokers. Uh, they don't care about you as the individual, but they care about individuals at scale. And the more information they know about any given individual, this person is interested in this kind of shoe, this kind of app, this kind of TV show, this kind of person that's within their social network, your contacts lists and so on. Um, they begin to hold a map of many human lives. And then they can begin to buy uh, parts of this map that they like or they don't like to get them paid uh, as they would prefer. Uh, so we are basically being pushed into a world where we ourselves are forced to live electronically naked. Uh, at the same time, our rules, right, our, our betters and in these institutional classes uh, are themselves cloaked from us. There is privacy for power, uh, but exposure for powerless. Listening to you, we many of us feel slightly helpless. Um, in your book, you're talking about this brief and be beautiful time when the internet was mo mostly made of by and for the people. Um, you're, you're raising awareness. You're talking about this mass surveillance, that it's a never ending census. Isn't it too late? It's already happening. People are already surveyed. What would you say to people who, you know, what can we do about all this? You know, this is the reflexive response to seeing negative events in the world. Uh, we see this happening uh, with social justice movements, with racial justice movements, particularly uh, in the context of police violence, um, where it's very much the same dynamics. The smallest and most vulnerable members of society uh, are held to the highest standard of accountability. You, you break the smallest and you face the most uh, ruthlessly uh, or ruthlessly enforced uh, 
system of justice. At the same time, if you're a uh, titan of industry, if you are a uh, national scale politician with deep connections, you face a very different kind of justice, even for the most serious scandals. We see this at the level of the presidency in the United States. Um, we have seen this for decades, uh, again, in corporate behavior, uh, not just as personified in the individual corporate executive, but also for the corporations themselves. We see it for banks, right? They're involved in money laundering on a historic scale, and they pay a, you know, a tiny slap on the wrist fine. So what does this mean, as you say, and, you know, what do we do about it? Well, just as games teach players to become more sophisticated over time. They, they teach you the rules of the game through an increasingly difficult series of challenges, right? Uh, for example, famously in Super Mario's NES era, uh, you start the very first screen, you're on the far left, uh, and Mario's only uh, abilities in that game are to move and to jump. That's it, without any power-ups or whatever. And there is a very, very, very slow side of the screen uh, that is walking towards you. Very slowly, very easy to avoid. Uh, but it's saying if you don't do anything, as, as the frog, you are going to be foiled. Uh, as you move forward in the game, the challenges become more intense, greater, until, and your uh, level of skill expression is expected to be higher. What's interesting about the game society has created for all of us playing in the world today uh, is we are punished largely for resisting the system as it is. Uh, and we are not rewarded for success in challenging the system. Rather, things like being driven into exile or imprisonment are the responses for that. In the United States, something that I never would have thought as a child uh, when I was watching TV shows where whenever a teacher did something a kid didn't like, they would respond, it's a free country, isn't it? Is to see the emblematic expression of police in every city, in every state, that the first things you hear them say in any interaction that's uh, played on the news or reported on the street today is stop resisting. What does it mean when we teach a world uh, when we teach populace from that scale uh, to stop resisting, when we try to create an impression that you will be rewarded if you stop resisting, uh, and that you will face consequences if you do resist, well, precisely what you expressed right there, the sense that there's nothing that anyone can do, that it's already happened, that it's too late. But the reality is it's not. Um, we can begin resisting any time. Uh, and the system that exists today can change at any moment, particularly when we're talking about small ball stakes, like the fact that we're being funds, games, right? Uh, that we're reading articles with. Uh, there is a principle today uh, called the, the third party doctrine. It's much more complex than this. But the idea is that once a company gains records about by hook or by crook, uh, they're no longer your records. They're the company's records. They're the company's property, even though the details of these records are about you, or some other person. And so the company then can use their property however they like. They can sell it, they can resell it, they can share it, they can do whatever. And if there's any claim against them, these companies hold up uh, this magic talisman for them in the system. Uh, the terms of service, the EULA, or the end user licensing agreement. And they say, well, you agreed to this. Did we? Uh, we are all today presented uh, this click OK to continue prompt. Uh, multiple points uh, of it. Right? You go to a website and it's like, you know, cooking, green, whatever. Uh, you have to click OK or the video won't play, the web page won't load. You buy a brand new phone before you can use the phone. It says you have to agree to these terms of service and you know, they write it with all these permission prompts. It's like, do you want your location services to be turned on? Uh, do you wanna share activities from your phone with Google? And everybody's like, no, 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 no. 
but then you click OK and effectively, legally, you have consented to a much greater um, assignment of rights to these companies. But the reality is there's no way to uh, sort of click not OK and continue. Because if it was, if there were that option, everyone would do it. No one wants to agree to these exploitative systems. Uh, and yet we are not afforded a choice. The illusion of consent, uh, the illusion of our agreement with these systems is being uh, used uh, to replace the fact of our consent, a meaningful consent to these agreements. These are unequal agreements from which we can't escape, right? But again, does it have to be that way? Well, think about every other industry where uh, someone might have really personal, very private uh, information of your activities, right? When we talk about your therapist, uh, you know, a psychiatrist, when we talk about a health coach, when we talk about a doctor, who knows why you came in last time, uh, what was wrong with you, what you needed help with, you know, what kind of medications you were prescribed. When we talk about, uh, for example, a financial advisor, um, your concerns, you know, you're trying to plan for a retirement or this, that, or the other. These people have what is called a fiduciary interest to you. Uh, they are forbidden, um, sometimes uh, in, in many countries uh, by law, uh, other times through professional organizations and from using this information to benefit themselves or any other person to your detriment. So why is it that uh, in the case of the internet and all the businesses that are connected to it, uh, we make an exception. We say, uh, it's not okay for your doctor who comparatively knows very, very little about you. Uh, to share this information, but it is okay for Google, who saw you purchase your medications, who saw you searching for the details of your condition and everything else, to do whatever they want. Why is it okay for Mark Zuckerberg uh, to exploit you in every conceivable way, and not just you, your entire family and everyone else on your social graph that you're connected to, uh, right down to how far you toss a pigeon in the angry birds, uh, but it's not okay. Uh, you know, for a lawyer that you had contact with for one time about a disagreement about where a fence lies on the property line. Which one of these things actually has more impact on our lives on the long scale? Uh, and why is it that we are um, applying greater regulations to the less impactful niches in that traditionally were seen as more privacy impairing? when in reality, uh, Google can do more damage to any one of us than the combination of all the professional organizations that you've dealt with in your entire life. Edward Snowden, the, the focus has very much been on regulations. What you're saying right now is this focus should be on uh, collecting data, basically. People should raise awareness about that. I mean, when, look, it's very popular for regulators today who remember are being lobbied uh, with incredible financial backing by richest corporations in history, basically, um, not to regulate here. And when they must regulate, uh, these industries are going, well, okay, if you have to regulate, here's our preferred form of regulation. Here's what won't harm innovation, whatever they call it today. Um, and it's been very popular since then to go, okay, well, the problem is data protection, right? We've all heard about in Europe, they've got the GDP, or the General Data Protection uh, Regulation. Um, and all of these little uh, legislative proposals that emulate that are bubbling up in other countries. And the, the way they justify this is, you know, data breaches and hacking, we've seen this and it's become big stories in the news. Uh, and this implies, that, well, it's okay if the company, so as long as they keep it safe. And the problem is when the company uh, loses its hold on this information, somehow it spills in, you know, some hacker gets it. But that's not really the threat. It's not the hacker that is causing problems at a society-wide scale. Um, it is the companies 
that, that are causing uh, the problems at a continuing scale, right? The hacker is a problem, yes, uh, but they are far lower order problem than the behavior that actually needs to be targeted. So what's happening here is we're being told that we have a data protection problem. I'm here to tell you that we don't have a data protection problem. We have a data collection problem. If you stop the collection, there's very little that we need to protect. If the companies don't hold the information in the first place, uh, they don't need to go to the information. There's nothing for the hacker to take, right? Uh, if we could reduce the sphere of information that has been uh, effectively stolen from us by deception, uh, we won't have this great vulnerability that now everyone is ringing. Before we get to, we have one question from uh, a viewer, just a very quick reaction about the uh, President Biden just signed this executive order on this uh, cyber attack. I just wanted to have your reaction on that. Yeah, I mean, look, we recognize that, uh, again, hackers and things like this are a problem. Um, we do have an incredibly brittle uh, global network. Why is that? It is precisely because policies um, that have been held out and expanded intentionally by national governments for the last 50 years. Uh, governments, including particularly the United States government, have used their, rep rep uh, their representation in standards making bodies uh, to do things like keep the cell phone networks insecure. Uh, they will make them use weak ciphers to protect our communications, right? This is a kind of encryption. We might talk more about it later. Um, but the idea I mentioned earlier, electronically naked, our communications as they transit the internet, uh, the, uh, the types of software that we create, um, and the level of quality that we require has always been low. And when the government, for example, uh, discovers some vulnerability, uh, in national or global scale infrastructure, like they found a weakness in Microsoft programs or Apple programs. Um, frequently, uh, they conceal this information and use the knowledge of that vulnerability to spy on other people around the world. This is called exploiting a vulnerability, right? This is hacking in the classic sense. Uh, if you discover a vulnerability in software that nobody else knows about, you can use that to break into every iPhone in the world, for example, um, or anybody who visits a website where you can get in between the connection uh, that's using a particular browser, for example, which is used in uh, all the Android uh, phones around the world. If you find a vulnerability in the way that those Android phones render a web page, right? They receive the data about it and then they, you know, start filling in. This is a picture. This is a text. Whatever. Um, you can hijack the phone, effectively the execution operations on the phone, and you can do anything you want. And the government does do this. And the government has permitted a commercial industry around this that is for-profit companies that do nothing today. They, their entire business is to find critical vulnerabilities in most important programs and networks around the world, and then sell them. Uh, they sell them to governments around the world. And what skills do these people develop? Where are they being used uh, when their only reward uh, is for break? Now, uh, there is a desire for us around the world, of course, to have skills to find these vulnerabilities because we want to discover these vulnerabilities and have them be closed. Because if they're not closed, uh, again, anybody who finds this can let themselves in phones, let themselves into our laptops, let themselves into our gas networks, as happened in the United States. Okay. Um, but uh, the problem is, for too long, governments haven't been closing these holes. They have been setting up entire cottage industries that help them find these holes. And you know, governments pay them money and they say, hey, here's a way to get into this phone, here's a way to get into this website. Here's a way to get into whatever you want, and that's a million dollars, right? Um, it's actually more than that. Uh, but the idea is, what if, for the last 50 years, instead of rewarding people, uh, rewarding businesses, rewarding government agencies for keeping our global network vulnerable, 
uh, we had been rewarding them for making them more secure? What if we had been incentivizing people to uh, close these vulnerabilities, to fix these vulnerabilities, uh, instead of uh, telling them, well, the best thing that you can do with this is sell this on gray or black market. Now, as to the actual uh, concerns of the order itself, um, the top line thing that I've noticed, and I haven't read this uh, in full depth, is the fact that the US government seems to be uh, ordering a restructuring of its contractual relationships with uh, the companies and businesses that it has uh, contracting for federal government services with. Who does the federal government uh, contract with? Everybody that matters, right? We're talking about Apple, uh, we're talking about Microsoft, we're talking about Google. Most importantly, and I think most quietly, we're talking about Amazon, particularly Amazon's web services. Amazon Web Services uh, runs basically half the largest sites on the internet. Now, the government is saying they get so that anybody who contracts with the government uh, must have new contract clauses that require them to share information about what is happening in their networks, not only with defensive agencies of the federal government, like the FBI, uh, which is only pseudo defensive uh, to begin with, but it explicitly says other intelligence agencies. So now we're going to have uh, Microsoft, Amazon, everybody else explicitly sharing their network information with the intelligence agencies of the United States. And that is a very dangerous and inappropriate precedent to set. I will definitely follow that. So we have a question, if we go back to the online gaming, we have a question from Luke Donahue from Liverpool. He say, he's asking, it looks like the next frontier of gaming is going to be immersive technologies such as virtual augmented reality. What do you believe are the deeper privacy implications of having these devices strapped to our faces that not only const constantly analyze the environment around us, but also analyze our emotional state through face and eye tracking sensors? I mean, I, I think the question answers itself, right? When we look at the uh, invasive properties of gaming and as they progress, originally we had the kid on the couch right, wherever they were uh, in my generation. And the most that could be known about them uh, is you know, credit card networks or whatever, or the Toys R Us, uh, or the Radio Shack or whatever, uh, sees what card purchased what games. That, that was really the maximally invasive uh, extent that the industry could reach for analytics, uh, because there was no connection. There was no talk back coming from the devices on which they were played. Uh, there were no online surveys, there were no whatever. Then we moved to uh, the same kinds of consoles, but they're remotely connected. Uh, now your activities in the game can be sent back to the developer or uh, whoever, um, or shared with groups like Facebook because many people are mobile first gamers. Now they're not playing on consoles, they're playing while they sit on the bus or in the back of a car. Um, and they don't even realize their location is being tracked and other things um, by these games. Uh, but it is now you have a much greater corpus of information. However, these games were not able to do things like track your games. Eye tracking is a uh, really fun uh, technology that's used in these new virtual reality headsets uh, to perform something called foveated rendering. We're talking about uh, creating a 3D environment that changes and is re-rendering as you look around and move your head. Um, obviously, the headset needs to be able to tell where you're looking, where you're turning your head, right? In order not to render the entire scene that you can't see because of the weaknesses of human peripheral vision, uh, they just want to see where you're actually looking, the small part that your eye is hitting. And they'll draw that crisply cleanly. There's a lot of effort to make that look good. And everything else that you don't see clearly, they'll do a lazier job on it so the device will be more efficient. But think about now, can a developer or the manufacturer of the headset, which is Facebook, for one of the largest virtual reality headsets today, they can actually see in the game what you look at. 
how long you looked at it, what caught your attention, what caught your interest, you know, not just uh, the decisions you made, but increasingly as we get uh, more of this stuff, uh, your level of excitation response to. Um, I think we should very much be concerned about that. We should certainly limit uh, how this information can be collected and used. There, there's a, um, a very basic principle here that I, I think people, at least regulators, certainly miss. Um, if a category of information is not absolutely necessary to collect uh, in order to provide the, for the essential functions of their business, it should not be collected. And if it is being collected, there should be questions answered, and I think in penalties assessed. What is the fear? What is your fear about, about this? I mean, I, I think I just described it in bold strokes. Um, really, it comes down to that question earlier, um, what can we do about this? Society is being engineered uh, largely via technology. Um, and this is both uh, simply broadcast communications technology, both on the large public scale, you think traditional cable programming, the way that propaganda works through these systems, um, but also in social media where you can say different things to different categories of population. Uh, quiet voice here, loud voice there. Um, we are seeing an engineering of opinion uh, to provide for this redistribution of power where people feel disempowered to change the system. So they do not resist the injustice of these systems um, wherever they encounter them. They feel as though they can do nothing about it. And as they begin to internalize, the presumed truth of this um, state of affairs, technology quietly moves in um, to entrench that system and to detect uh, anomalies, anomalous responses, anomalous behavior, anomalous individuals. Uh, these people are the minority. But the, the thing is, the minority is where progress arises from. Look throughout every sort of truly unjust political history, right? you'll see something quite unusual, I think, to modern sensibility, which is the fact that the law, as it stood, was unjust. And resistance against the unjust law was the thing that was illegal. The legality of a thing is very different from the morality of the thing. And I think we are being taught daily through a thousand stories exposed, you know, in a thousand moments. There's headlines that we don't, the stories we don't even read, but we see the headline. Uh, we see the picture. We see the meme again, again, and again, and again. We see what happens in the game, the culture that reflects the stories that we tell. And we internalize these decisions into calculations that say you will be punished for doing the right thing, and you will be rewarded for doing the wrong thing. And this technology, um, develops a greater sense to discriminate the ones who are to be rewarded uh, for their obedience and the ones who are to be punished for their desire for uh, progress. Early intervention uh, will create the possibility of China-style population management at scale. How do you how do you how these technologies these data these record you know this question from Lucas about face and eye tracking sensors could it be harmful and the way they're going to use it and how are they going to use that information and in your view is it can it be used to be harmful? Uh, yeah, obviously we we already see facial uh, biometrics in general. Um, there is this type of over the skin surveillance, right? Uh, large scale physical surveillance, which we're all familiar with um, in the general sense. You go into the gas station, there's a video camera, right? We've internalized, we've accepted that. It's been the state of play since you know, 
in 70. Um, but then there are other segments of it, which we are peripherally aware of, but we don't necessarily expect it. For example, license plate readers. Uh, you're driving your car um, and there's you know a camera on a pole somewhere. You might think it's a speed camera. Maybe it is a speed camera. Maybe it's both. Uh, but the idea is every car that passes by these cameras is not being photographed for you know make and model, um, but make model and your license. Uh, and of course, your license plate can be tied back to your identity access uh, to these kind of information. And when you think about these at scale, when you think about highway on ramps and off ramps, when you think about you know um, shopping centers, when you think about all the watering holes uh, at which uh, human society is, um, you think, okay, now they can track humans at scale through our means of conveyances, right? Our, our, our ways to transport ourselves bodily. Then you think about the fact that these cameras at the gas station now aren't just recording footage, but they're starting to do object recognition. They go, a car rolls up. It's a car that's this make and model. This car with this make and model, even if the license plate isn't visible, could be correlated with this one that was that license plate. Person gets out of this car. They're wearing this clothing. They have this face. Have we seen this face? Who is this face associated with? What payment method did this face use when it entered this store at a completely different uh, shopping center across town or across the country? And, and as these things treat, they build on top of each other. Uh, and what you get is you get a um, deeper and more complex relationship between person, the habit, means of payment, uh, the method of transportation, the property records, the family records, uh, the leading interests, until everything is made about you uh, by everyone but who has any measure of power or resources in society. And you know nothing about them. And the funny thing is, they didn't have to lift a finger to do it because it happened through automated processes. And then what happens when we go beyond above the skin and we start under the skin? We talk about you know, um, health metrics that are you know, through your watch or whatever. Right now, maybe it's not transmitted off the device. Um, but increasingly, we see that these things are other services that want you to provide this information because it allows them to improve their products or services, whatever uh, sense they give. Or they say they anonymize these data sets before transmitting. Well, you can't anonymize human activity uh, or human characteristics at scale. Uh, there have been studies done again and again that with an anonymous data point or data set, if you get something as small as like two or three uh, different locations, um, you can basically uh, re or, or de anonymize some in an anonymous data set. Think about, for example, uh, if someone got uh, all of your movements uh, through life, and it was completely anonymous, they didn't have anything about them, uh, anything about your personal information. But your phone stops for eight hours a day, you know, at least, or whatever, uh, at your house. And it spends another significant period of time, back in the before times, uh, <laughs> at the office. And just with those points, uh, people can already rule out, you know, many, many orders of magnitude of humanity. And the potential people uh, that this could be are only the ones who sleep every day in this house or this apartment or whatever. Uh, when we start to get people's emotional states, when we start to get a sense of their inner thinking, uh, even if it's just through inference of their heart rate, their perspiration, their gait, their uh, facial analysis to go, okay, we know this face, but it's the emotional thing, state of this face. Is it happy? Is it sad? It's watching a TV show about this. This politician is speaking, responding favorably, or are they responding unfavorably? These are not really complicated capabilities for technologies that exist today. We're talking the scale of engineering challenges rather than scientific challenges. Uh, and to me, that says we have a regular challenge.
because if that's a world that looks attractive to people, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Uh, it's pretty obvious to me on what those dangers are. We have a question from uh, William uh, Gadori. Uh, Edward Snowden, what value would a player's in-game moral choices and accomplishments have to a AAA game publishing company except from market research? Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure I uh, understood the question. Okay, so yeah. what, but, what, uh, would, go ahead. What, would, what would be good alternatives for gamers or consumers that are playing video games? Yeah, I mean, the idea here that, um, I mean, the, the, the ideal alternative is simply that this telemetry not be provided. Um, a developer uh, should not be presumed to know every player's every choice. If a player wants to opt in to sharing this information uh, to help development or you know, to personalize their experience, sure, when they could have that choice. Um, but the idea that these things happen by default, the idea that these things um, happen because a, a game engine you know, affords the capability for it uh, is, I, I think, generally quite wrong. Um, when we think about uh, the usefulness of these things uh, as they're described, it's largely justified on the basis of either you know, marketing research, uh, or what it's really tied to, which is uh, development priorities. They go, well, we want to create a forking path in the game's narrative. Uh, you can choose to go into the woods or you can choose to go into the mountains. How many players choose to go into the woods? How many players choose to go into the mountains? Well, if it's tremendously lopsided, we know 90% of people want to go into the mountains, then we should put as many resources towards developing the experience of the woods. Um, there's an argument. Does that justify the mass surveillance of the entire player base? I would say no. Um, I'll leave it at that. We have a, we have a lot of uh, questions. Um, Eric Lessa, how do you see Apple's position regarding tracking possibilities? Do you believe in some type of ethic data management to appear as a general practice in the future? Yeah, so I, I think when we talk, this is getting to Apple's new AirTags devices that are out there, um, which are really just a privacy disaster. Um, to their credit, uh, Apple has tried to provide some <laughs> vestigial warning uh, that you're being tracked here, where like if the tracker follows you for three days, it'll start um, sounding an alarm. Uh, but you know you can squelch these physically open the device, remove the speaker, close it, and then put it on someone. And they go, well, you know, your phone can detect this thing and your phone will send a warning. Um, but if we're talking about things like intimate partner violence, um, where you spend the night with the person who might be secretly tracking you, and they might have access to your phone, they can say, uh, go into your options and say, let's ignore this warning. Um, more generally, I think that we should be asking the question, do we need a world with more tracking devices? Should, a, should corporate responsibility infer that these kind of uh, capabilities are provided where someone at Apple goes, huh, you know, every Apple phone has a little tracking on it most of the time. It's got a wireless radio unit that we use for Wi-Fi connections. That uh, is also capable of hearing Bluetooth connections. Has another radio that's capable of hearing cellular connections, right? Uh, so it knows where all the cell phone towers are around you. It also has the ability to hear GPS positioning satellites. And they go, we made a little Bluetooth beacon that any phone in the world would help others report, uh, even if that iPhone isn't like explicitly saying, do you want to help, you know, narc on this token that you just walked past? Because Apple goes, oh, people, you know, we're going to have billions of these devices out there. We want people saying yes, 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 yes all day, or no, 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 no. Uh, so let's just make them happily join. Let's just make them report on this all the time. Now, the funny thing is, this is not like an extraordinary new technology. 
Um, these capabilities already exist. Uh, this is used for providing location services. This is how phone knows where you are when you don't have a good GPS signal. They go, well, you're near this Wi-Fi access point, which is a Starbucks. You can also hear this Wi-Fi access point, which is a bank. And we know from previous GPS fixes from other people's phones that the place where you can hear both the Starbucks and the bank has to be within this circle, right? That's you know, however wide. Um, so this person is probably. Uh, with the come open for our devices to be in mapping where everything, everyone within it uh, is, what their activities are, and for that to be like a big policy conversation, for that not to be a big anything, for that simply to be business as usual. Well, we see more and more corporations going in this way. They can act uh, with full, I like to say, freedom from permission. This is the classical concept that we once called liberty, right? The ability to act without asking anyone if it's okay. And at the same time, for us, for the individual, for the people living in the society they have created, we have freedom from permission. In fact, more uh, permissioning gates we are required to pass through on any given day. Uh, you have to click OK to continue. You have to, you know, send your CV. You have to send your photo. You have to send your passport to the bank. You know, you have to show uh, it's this kind of credit card. It's this kind of proof of address. Uh, our experience freedoms as individuals are becoming um, more limited. Rather, we are being uh, judged uh, as desirable consumers, as desirable accounts on social media platforms, desirable voices, desirable people. At the same time, no one is making judgments on a global scale about are these corporations and their activities desirable. And this is where people begin to get that sense of disempowerment from. They see that we have two-tiered systems of justice uh, between the institutional or the institutionally connected and the individual. Uh, and I think that's where a lot of this trouble arises from. You, you mentioned earlier that you, you know, people can resist, people have the power to, to, to do something. M many, many people, many of my colleagues, many people actually agree to the fact that they don't want to be surveilled, they don't want to be, uh, they don't want companies to know about their private life. Um, how do you resist, though? You said it's not enough just to um, criticize or to say I'm against it. What can people actually, how do you resist in, in your view? Well, there's uh, many different ways. Um, the first step is always to care, right? And when people say uh, that they don't care, um, to judge them. Ask why. Uh, what does it mean if nobody cares? What does it mean if we not today, in this moment, uh, what happens tomorrow? What happens when we create a, a new norm uh, where we all ignore a missing stare in society, a, a known flaw that people just walk around, they, they deal with because they know it's there. And what happens when someone who doesn't know about it uh, is hurt by it? Um, I think one of the most important um, that we have lost uh, within my lifetime is a sense of solidarity in movements, uh, certainly uh, a sense of representation by our politicians. Uh, if you look at many of the most advanced democracies in the world, um, and honestly, you look at uh, many of the most authoritarian countries in the world, uh, you'll see that they're all gravitating toward each other. Uh, if you think about the sort of political compass or graph, uh, where we've got two axes, right? Um, you've got the liberal and the conservative. That's where so much of our political conversation takes place. But no one really talks about the authoritarian and the libertarian axis. And what's happening is that company or countries and companies, uh, whether they hold liberal or conservative values, they're all sort of moving north toward more authoritarian policies. And this, I think, divorces them um, from the majority of populations 
uh, which themselves hold uh, no influence or power. Uh, they have no ability to uh, really assert their will at scale, uh, who have no authority and instead are merely subject to authority. Um, and as a uh, sort of natural response, we would at least infer they have a more libertarian positioning this chart, even if we're not talking like libertarian south end of the chart, but we're merely talking more a centrist uh, ideology for, for the total, totally apolitical person. Uh, no one wants the police to kick in their door and drag their children out and their, their journals and whatnot, um, certainly without cause. But uh, what we need in a world where there uh, is no political power without institutional representation, um, is either institutional representation that is powerful enough to achieve reform, uh, or the alternative, uh, unfortunately, in heaven, uh, is the system becomes uh, unstable, and that leads to revolution. Uh, when we talk about the possibility of revolution, in a modern day society, it's uh, really a dark path. It's not anything that I think anyone wants to see um, because the mechanisms for violence and its application uh, are very much not in the hands of the public. Uh, and so when we talk about uh, what we can do, when we're talking about the, the nonviolent sense, um, we need to recognize that we have to share at least some subset, subset of values that the institution can represent, that uh, we can basically resource this institution um, to fight all these other guys. The problem is now we're talking about the non-governmental, non-profit, commercial institution against the richest institutions in society. And if this in any way gets people you know, a little bit pessimistic or bit concerned, I'm going, well, that doesn't seem very likely. Uh, the question that you should ask yourself is why? Why does it seem unlikely? How do we arrive at that state of play? Who is responsible for it? And why is it that it would seem an unjust system uh, is being intentionally stabilized through legislation, through regulation, and barriers to um, reform are being enacted? Uh, at the same time, the, the slogan of the sort of police forces uh, is becoming stop resisting. That is a flag that a system very much uh, does not want to be changed. And I think at that point, we really need to start asking difficult questions about mandate um, and talking about ways where if the political process will not provide for change, do we have alternative means? And this does not mean violence. This can mean things like enforcing our rights through technology and science. Um, are there ways we can guarantee human rights? Are there ways we can enforce human rights, such as the right to privacy? Uh, not merely through legislation, which we want, or regulations, which we want, uh, but can we create devices, tools, and services that the average person can use without expertise, they don't even know it's there, that protect your communications? Uh, encryption is the greatest example of this in my lifetime. Um, it does not solve all pro privacy problems, but it solves a very large category of privacy problems. And you use encryption every day, whoever you are listening to this. Um, and the vast majority of the times that you do use it, you don't even need to be aware. It's happening invisibly. Thank you. Thank you for that. So we have, um, there, there's a question, if resisting is the solution, how do we do it? You just answer that question. Um, there is another question uh, from Charte Tessier. The app tracking transparency recently announced, and you've answered that one as well. Sorry about that, Ed. From Hassan, thinking about technologies that help us to play against mass surveillance. We have encryption, of course, but in addition to encryption with technologies in the horizon, do you believe would benefit individuals over the surveillance state? Which technology yeah. would, yeah. Yeah, when, when we think about uh, 
this is all really part of the, <laughs> it's an extension of the previous question. Yeah. Uh, really, what do we do? It's this unjust system, if we recognize it, and uh, we are intentionally, strategically being some do we simply accept it? Uh, do we go just, yeah, this is okay. And, you know, if there's technologies, which technologies are we to have them? What do we use? Uh, um, there is, <laughs> sorry, it, 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 it's a difficult question. I mean, this is why I, I give it thought. Let's put it in the context of games. Because this is the conversation, this is the conference, this is uh, what we're here for. Imagine you're playing a game. Um, most games we presume to be fair, right? Uh, the I, I wrote in uh, my book, um, From the Record, uh, actually, that uh, the, the deep psychological appeal of games uh, is the belief that they can be won. Right? And, and nowhere is this more clear uh, to me than in the case of the Rubik's Cube, right? Uh, it satisfies that universal fantasy. If we just work hard enough, if you twist yourself through all possibilities and permutations, everything that was scrambled, that was out of place, the colors were misaligned and incoherent, will just finally click into place, perfectly aligned, that our human ingenuity is enough to transform the most broken and chaotic system into something logical and orderly. Uh, where every face, three-dimensional space, uh, shines in perfect uniformity. But what if the system wasn't fair? What if it wasn't designed to provide uh, for a chance to win? Well, every system has a set of rules. Being a hacker and hacking, uh, as I, I define it in my book, Hacking is simply trying to understand the system of rules better than the one who created it. They believe the system operates in a certain way through a system of mechanics that they design. And they have presumptions upon which they rely. What if we wanted to change that system? What if we wanted to attack that system? What if we wanted to win a game that was designed not to be won? Well, we'd have to hack it. What that means is we start looking for points of failure in the system. The system presumes people go about their activities in a certain kind of way, which exposes them to certain kinds of influences. It limits their choices to a certain step. What if we look for ways to escape that system? What if we look for ways to engage in a whole new subset of activities that was either reserved for a different player or set of players, or was intended to be forbidden entirely. In 2013, in my interactions with the uh, US National Security Agency, was that the US government had the Constitution. We had a system of checks and balances that was supposed to provide for play, fair play. Co equal branches of government, the judiciary, the legislature, and the executive. They were supposed to police each other. It had not presumed that these actors would collaborate and collude on the interests of the public because they were intended to represent the public. What happens then when this system fails? Do we have alternative mechanisms when government itself becomes unaccountable, urgent, mm -hmm. extremely resistant to accountability? Is there another option? For me, this was the fourth estate, right? Uh, a, a route outside of government by which to return government decisions to, if not public control, at least public accountability. And so I gathered evidence of what I believe that I've done wrong and brought it to the public. That's the only reason you know anyone has heard of my name. Who well, I am was not important. What I thought was not important. What I could prove was. And the reason why was because it showed that the system was unfair. It showed that the rules had been broken. It showed that the law had been broken. It showed the Constitution had been broken. When we look at the systemic injustice that plagues our societies today, uh, whether we're talking about uh, racial injustice, 
um, and things like the George Floyd uh, abuses. What we see is a lack of accountability. Accountability is not equally applied, even applied across a society. Um, if you are selling cigarettes on the street, uh, you are held to a certain accountability of legal uh, behavior. If you are a police officer, you have a much higher level of legal protection, even if you engaged in uh, outright indefensible activities. But what if you're a politician? Right? What if you're a corporation, you become um, unaccountable. And what we see is we see the public at large recognizing this. Uh, people of every race, people of every belief, uh, and beginning to try to restore a sense of accountability to government. I keep saying accountability, what do I mean? I mean, there is impunity for official misconduct, for the abuse of systemic privileges. The public accountability to this is at least our awareness of this, but ultimately that's only the beginning. What we have to do to restore a sense of fair play in the game as it has been presented to us is to make sure consequences are not born only by a single class player, as they unfortunately are today. We have the people who hold the most power in society held to the loosest standards of behavior. They have the freest play, when they should in fact have the most restricted play uh, because their actions have the most consequences for all of the other players. And the players who have very little power are the ones who are held to the highest standard. That is what needs to be amended. That is what needs to be corrected. In an earlier time, we used to call these categories of players private citizens, about which nothing was new because they wielded no power. And then uh, public officials, uh, public implying their lives were open to us. We knew everything about them because they, their decisions affected all of us. But now we have private officials and public citizens. We can fix this, but first we have to agree that it is a problem. You mentioned George Floyd and accountability. On the day of the verdict, uh, people felt very much empowered because they were happy about the verdict. Um, and one of the things we all saw is the, the solidarity, uh, all races, even the police, uh, chief of police um, testified against uh, Derek Chauvin. In the virtual world, you know, it took, unfortunately, it took the unfortunate death of George Floyd for a lot of people to realize about systemic racism. If we go back to the virtual world about raising awareness, I mean, what would it take in your view to have a, some sort of, not a, you know, George Floyd effect, but uh, would it take something similar to that in the online world, do you think, for people to actually come together and start a, a conversation? for change? I think the sad truth of uh, so much of the abuse and response that we've seen in the last decades is we live incredibly comfortable lives relative to the historic norm. Um, even for people who are struggling. But we see that level of comfort decreasing. We see that people struggling more, uh, even as we see, you know, by economic metrics, things have never been better. And when we're told things are getting better, this is abuse. What we witness is injustice. Uh, that's when people start asking questions uh, about the system. And I, I think that's really um, what we have seen. People do not respond or people may care, uh, people will not care um, until they see something that makes them uncomfortable. Perhaps because they feel threatened by it, they feel like it may not just affect this distant other, um, but it could someday affect them, it could someday affect their community, it could uh, someday affect their system of values and beliefs, that it becomes personal. And then they're willing to not just, not just believe, but to have it. 
<laughs> revives a fear of consequence that governments for too long have forgotten. We ordinary people go through our entire lives cognizant of the possibility of consequence. Uh, but if you are a very rich man at the head of a very powerful corporation, very powerful minister, you know, sitting in a very uh, uh, influential committee, you don't live with a sense of consequences. You believe you can exempt yourself from them. The system does it for you, or you can escape consequences. And it is that presumption of the pimp which this grand structure of injustice relies. If we restore a sense of consequence, Reform follow. We have two two more questions on online gaming. Um, what would you recommend to parents to protect their children? What would you recommend to teenagers who are getting their first phone and are struggling with their parents' advice? So this is a uh, this is a really difficult question. Um, my only child is is very young, uh, just a few months now, so I haven't had to think about this in the same level of detail that I'm sure I'm coming to this. Uh, but I think the single most important thing that I would recommend to any parent or child today is you need visibility of the operations or the network operations of your phone. Uh, this is to say right now, your phone that you're watching this on uh, is sending you know hundreds of network communications a second to provide the video, to provide the audio, right? But also to feed all of the other apps that are on your phone in the background, or the other tabs in your browser, whether it's a desktop machine or whatever, are they refreshing themselves? Are they you know, doing whatever? Do you have a software app installed that's like sending a checkout to a licensing server? I mean, is this still valid? Whatever. Um, is it sending information about your activity? Is your computer on? You know, is this process active? What is it doing? All of these things are happening right now that are invisible, intentionally, strategically hidden by the phone's operating system. Uh, Apple does not really provide a useful way to get this information. Uh, they are very resistant to any kind of firewalling programs on the phone because they feel like that's a level of technical complexity uh, to which people shouldn't be exposed. The only way around it uh, on Android phones for people who are truly expert users, that's it's all, is to use a similar kind of workaround. This is like a fake VPN is what it's called. There are applications like there's one called Neck for Android phones that will basically tell all of the applications on your phone that there is no available wireless access, there is no available uh, you know, internet access except through this little gateway. And this little gateway is actually provided by an app that tells you what walks through it. So it tells you when through your weather app, for example, Facebook is fine. It tells you, for example, when through you know, Google or through uh, Angry Birds, you know, Google is fine. Something that you would never see and you would never have any control over. And then you can begin to decide, could I block these connections? Do I want Facebook to see this when we check on that? Or is that something that should be blocked? Every operating system in the world uh, should allow to just block connections that they do not want, that they do not desire. And there should not be connections that are happening to uh, a user's device that they can't see, they cannot observe, and they can't just click a green and red button that says, no, this is presumptive privacy violating operation. This is connecting to an ad. This is connecting uh, to you know, a tel telemetry. This is connecting to an update server or whatever. And for people to be able to decide, you know, I want my phone to be able to check for updates, but no, I don't want my phone to connect to others. There is no technical reason that Apple or Google could not provide these capabilities in a very user-friendly, uh, very understandable way that doesn't require all the technical knowledge that something like a NetGuard today does. Uh, and as for this thing about uh, teenagers struggling with their parents, 
do you understand the device better and how it works or do your parents? Um, if your parents understand it better, they're going to be able to control it and they're going to be able to control you. If they understand it, you might want to trust, uh, or if they understand it better than you, you might want to trust that they have you know, better judgment there. Maybe they don't. If they don't, it's your uh, responsibility to come to understand the system better than they do. At that point, you can look for those presumptions, right? Uh, you can hack that system um, and basically operate in the way that you prefer. Um, but you can't make good decisions uh, about whether you should or shouldn't do something until you understand how that system operates. There is no lock that can't be defeated. Good point. Um, Edward Sullivan, thank you so much. Before we, we end this conversation, very quickly, there's a new administration in Washington. Joe Biden is the new president. Is there any change for you, for your status, or what's the future? Uh, not like for, for me, but that's, I think, far less important than other whistleblowers. Uh, the Biden administration is has represented itself so far uh, as extremely hostile to whistleblowers and to the free press party. And I think it's tremendously offensive when we see just a few days ago, press freedom day, people like the president, the vice president, the secretary of state, are going out in front of cameras and saying, we believe in press, press freedoms, and we support uh, journalists and operations, people who reveal critical uh, material, and you know, government shouldn't stand in the way of that. At the same time, the Biden administration just months ago filed an appeal to keep Julian Assange in prison and to try to extradite him to the United States for his work in publishing stories that won awards around the world, very newspaper around the world. He's being charged under the Espionage Act. This has never been applied to publishers in the United States. Beyond this, when we talk about the sources of whistleblowers themselves, reality went U.S. whistleblower is still in prison. She was sentenced to five years in prison for sharing information that basically everyone would agree uh, was of public interest. Uh, the government should have provided itself, but they chose not to. Biden could not have the stroke of a pen uh, and release her early. He has chose not to do that. Even though at this point, it's only a few months. Daniel Hale, he is a whistleblower about US drone activities. Um, and he showed uh, through classified documents, as alleged by the government, um, that 90% of those killed by the government's drone assassination program um, were innocents or bystanders, not the targets of the actual drone strikes, 90%. Uh, he is going to be sentenced in July for this terrible crime uh, of telling us the truth about a program that 90% of its casualties uh, are unattended. This is very much something that this administration needs to change. And I think the press should very aggressively follow up on them and ask, when will this administration end the war on whistleblowers that has plagued us uh, since the Obama administration? Uh, really, the Bush administration tried to start the war on whistleblowers, but it really wasn't very effective. It was during the Obama administration that he charged more whistleblowers, uh, sources of journalism, under the Espionage Act than all other presidents combined. Trump certainly wanted to break this record, uh, but he simply, his administration wasn't very effective in achieving its policy goals. Uh, but we need to ask ourselves today, whistleblowers to continue, is it time to end? And if the White House feels that the place for an American whistleblower is in prison, uh, I think the press should look on that uh, unfavorably looking into that. Thank you very, very much, um, Mr. Edward Snowden. On behalf of the professors in Concordia, all the researchers, and on behalf of my fellow colleagues, journalists, thank you very much for being with us today. It was very enlightening to talk to you. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much.